Hi, uh, I'm Laura Marie Rivera with the Thundering 36, and we have a warm welcome for Sam Cho running for Port Commissioner Position 2. Uh, Sam, take it away. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much for the time and for allowing me to speak with you all and the Thundering 36. My name is Sam Cho. I'm currently the incumbent commissioner for the Port of Seattle uh, for Position 2. Uh, four years ago, I ran on a platform that committed to fighting for a port of the people. Uh, it was a platform that was based on the principle that people should come over politics. Well, as soon as I was sworn in in January of 2020, that was put to the test. COVID-19 was a once in a generation pandemic that truly shook the foundations of our society in many ways. We saw chaos in the supply chain and logistics space. Travel uh, through the airport came to a screeching halt. But I'm really proud to say that despite the chaos that COVID-19 created for the port, we weathered the pandemic without laying off a single port employee. And we were able to save every small and minority business at the airport. We were able to do this because we made principled decisions that put people first. Despite the pandemic, we were able to make major upgrades to the airport to become a four-star airport. And we made huge progress in sustainability and fighting human trafficking, which I look forward to uh, speaking more to. Um, as a candidate, I'm, I'm, I'm asking for four more years as your port commissioner because simply the job's not finished. In a post-pandemic world, we have to build the port of the future, a future where we create the next generation of strong family wage jobs, a future where we are the greenest port in North America, a future where we usher in new technology such as hydrogen and offshore wind. So with your support, we can build a port of the future that we can all be a proud of. Is that my time? You have a few more seconds. Okay. That was the warning. Out of the gate, I'm proudly endorsed by the Longshoremen's Union, the Seattle Building Trades, the Carpenters, Electricians, and the Muckleshoot Tribe, as well as the Washington Conservation Action and over 50 elected officials around the county. I sincerely hope to add the 36th, the thundering 36th district Democrats to that list. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Uh, now we have the questions. Uh, our first question will be coming from Jasmine. Hi. Uh, our first question is, gates at the new international terminal at SeaTac were not designed to be large enough for the intended planes. How did this happen and how will you prevent this sort of problem from occurring in future projects? I appreciate this. I, I just want to clarify the gates were designed to be large enough for the intended planes. It was not built to specifications. And so I want to make sure the public is fully aware that uh, the general contractor who had this job uh, failed to deliver on the design. Um, not to get too wonky here, but when we uh, started this project over eight years ago now, before I became a commissioner, we took on a process called design build, which is where we actually give the general contractor uh, uh, and uh, both the design and the building out of the terminal. Normally how it works is design bid build. First you design, then you bid out the contract. I think at the time we felt that uh, vertically integrating would make it go faster and cheaper. Uh, but I think it's safe to say you get what you pay for. Uh, we've learned a lesson on process and we have already undergone uh, a review of why the process did not work and whether or not we will continue to use the same design build process going forward. And so what, what I can say is that we will make sure that mistakes like this uh, will never be made again, but I will also say that it was a very good learning moment for the port for large scale projects like this, and um, we hope to never repeat it again. Thank you, Sam. Um, our next question will be coming from Jeremy. Okay, um, much of the port's core economic activities cause huge externalities and other environmental impacts, especially on low income immigrant and BIPOC communities. How do you support, how do you propose to make the port less damaging to the environment and more economically equitable? Yeah, I think part of what has changed in the last four years uh, at the port is that we have fully embraced the fact that uh, the activity of the port disproportionately impacts near communities. And so we have doubled down and allocated a tremendous amount of resources 
to making sure that those communities get the resources that they need. Um, one example is the South King County Impact Fund, which is a $10 million fund dedicated specifically to near airport communities. Uh, we have allocated tens of millions of dollars to mitigation packages that help insulate homes near the airport with sound mitigation. We've also allocated uh, a tremendous amount of our tax levy dollars towards cleanup uh, and specifically to the Duwamish waterway. We have been heavily involved in habitat restoration. And so part of what we have uh, taken on as support as, uh, as socially responsible stakeholders in the area is making sure that we are taking uh, funds and, and any surplus money that we create or generate and reinvesting it into the community so that they the effects of our activities are mitigated by, uh, you know, uh, mitigated as much as possible. Um, we also need to continue to create opportunities, economic opportunities for those communities, uh, you know, going forward in, in, in spaces like workforce development, career co connected learning, um, and whatnot. And so I really think that uh, we have doubled down on a lot of those uh, issue areas, and uh, there's obviously way more work to be done. And, and uh, you know, we have now a minority majority commission for the first time in the history of our commission that is very, very dedicated to making sure that we are a, 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 a organization driven by equity, diversity, and inclusion. Perfect timing. <laughs> well done. Uh, thank you. And our third question is coming from Ginny. The green cruise corridor may eventually reduce the enormous climate impact of cruise ships, but science tells us we need to reduce emissions now. How will you measure life cycle greenhouse gas emissions on the whole Alaska cruise route by next year? And how will you ensure zero emissions are achieved by 2040? Yeah, one of the big changes that we're making at the port is installing infrastructure that allows for the cruise industry to become more sustainable. I'm sure you've all heard about cold ironing or offshore power. It's something that we currently have at Terminal 91. It's something that is slated to actually be installed at Terminal 66, which is our other cruise terminal. But more importantly, the, the, the core of this question is about tracking and data. Uh, and we can't truly know how much progress we're making unless we can track the data. And currently, uh, there is no requirement, law, or regulation that says that the cruise industry has to report that data to us. And unfortunately, we are not a regulatory agency that can go out and maybe make that a compliance requirement. But one thing that I hope to explore is that if we do renew and or reopen our leases, we can actually put those data reporting requirements in our leases, in our lease agreement, and make that a condition for the cruise industry to continue to exist here. Uh, and so that's something that we are looking at and we hope to incorporate in all our cruise uh, operating agreements, such that in order to operate uh, here at the Port of Seattle as a cruise industry, you must you must uh, report that data. And that will create accountability, not just uh, uh, with ourselves as a commission, but also with the industry itself. So I'm really looking forward to making those uh, lease changes in the next several years. Thank you. And our last uh, scheduled question is coming from Sherry. Hey, um, the truckers who transport containers to and from the port are independent contractors and wage workers. These workers often cannot afford trucks that are low polluters. Yeah. As a port commissioner, what will you do to address the low wages of these workers? What will you do to address the pollution emitted by the trucks these drivers are using? Yeah, so, you know, um, I think it's fair to say that many truck drivers, um, whether it's at our airport or the seaport or misclassified, a lot of them are 1099 contractors. Um, and, you know, I think there's definitely uh, room for us to push for them to become full-time employees. Um, unfortunately, they these truck drivers are not directly employed by the port. They're employed by gate operators and other private sector entities. And so we're looking for ways to organize and get them to become uh, employees. I think as far as you know, uh, replacing trucks, you're right. These trucks are extremely expensive. They're upwards of a quarter of a million dollars per truck. And we can't put that burden of replacement on those truck drivers. So we've actually gone to the state legislature in Olympia, and we've actually asked for funding uh, to subsidize a clean trucks program. And it's something that the port and the Seaport Alliance has been extremely supportive of and something that we've been fighting for. 
uh, the Port of Seattle itself has a scraps program, which is uh, basically a, a program where if a truck driver wants to replace their truck with a more fuel efficient version, we will sub, uh, we will provide funds up to a certain amount to help them make that transition. I think the last thing that I'll just say on this topic is that in order for those trucks to become more fuel efficient and or electric or hydrogen, whatever the future is, the port needs to do its part in installing the infrastructure such that those trucks can recharge and refuel. Uh, and so it's part of our century agenda to make sure that our port facilities uh, have the infrastructure necessary in order to accommodate these new low uh, emission trucks. Thank you, Sam. And now we have our more open questions and these will be a one minute response. And it looks like Jeremy will have our first question. Sorry, I'm operating the timer right now as well. Let me let me just fix that. And thank oh. you for that. Okay. Um. Okay. Uh, my question: You mentioned you mentioned uh, hydrogen a few times. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, you know, where the port is planning to get to get the hydrogen from, um, and just the various impacts of that? Yeah, so one thing that was interesting is that on the federal level, the Biden administration has put in hundreds of millions of dollars, actually billions of dollars, to build out the hydrogen infrastructure around our country. And what they're building is called, what their, their strategy is based on the regional hub model. Uh, the goal uh, of the Inslee administration, as well as the port, is to become one of the hydrogen hubs for the United States. And the reason this makes sense for us is because, as you all know, our electricity cost is extremely low in Washington. And the region, reason is because our electricity primarily comes from hydro dams. And those hydro dams are what allows us for it to have a low kilowatt per hour. Uh, and so what we really need is just electrolyzers uh, that kind of feed in from our hydrogen power to create the hydrogen. And um, we think that this is a advantage compared to areas like California uh, we can be a net exporter of hydrogen in my perspective. And so I'm really excited to see how the port can be part of that supply chain and build out the infrastructure. Uh, we won't be in the production of hydrogen necessarily, but we will be in the business of transporting it and being the gateway for imports and exports of hydrogen. Thank you, Sam. Uh, do we have other questions? While we wait, I have my favorite one that I like to ask our candidates. Can you tell us one of your favorite parts about this job and also something that maybe the public doesn't know about the port commissioner role? Yeah, well, I think one thing that they don't know is that it's a part-time job. <laughs> Everyone kind of assumes that the port commissioner is a full-time gig, but unfortunately we are paid the same as part-time legislators. Our salaries are tied to the legislature. Um, you know, one thing that I really love about the port is that, it, you know, we, because we are a special purpose government that is focused on economic development, it gives us the license to really go anywhere in King County uh, in the name of economic development. And so I have the pleasure of working with electeds uh, all over the, uh, all over the county. Uh, we give grants to various cities um, and it really gives us a degree of freedom to become creative in some of our initiatives, initiatives and programming. Um, and so that's the best part about this is that it gives you a, a license of creativity that I don't think any other uh, legislative body or, uh, or a council uh, might give you. Um, I also love the international aspect of this. Obviously, my job is to bring business to the Port of Seattle, to the Puget Sound region. Um, and so going abroad and traveling internationally and convincing them to bring their business to our gateway to create good paying jobs is one of the best parts of this job. Thank you so much. Just checking to see if no one has a follow up, can you tell us a little bit more? Oh, I'm going to let Jeremy go and then I'll come back. Jeremy? Yeah, in your intro, you had mentioned that you wanted to say a little bit more about uh, human trafficking. Um, can you just expand what you had wanted yeah. to say there? So we we became uh, so we became the first port in the country to have proprietary anti-human trafficking awareness training for all port employees. So ninety percent of our employees today at the Port of Seattle are trained on anti-human trafficking uh, awareness. Uh, we recently uh, rolled out with a program that actually is now encouraging our tenants 
to do the same thing. So think about Alaska Airlines, Delta Airlines, all the airport dining and retail tenants. Those are not people who work directly for the port. There are tenants and part of the challenge is getting them to also take the training. Um, and so we are rolling out um, Port Allies Against Human Trafficking. It's, it's a pledge where our tenants uh, go uh, and they sign a pledge. They also have their uh, employees trained on this uh, awareness. Um, we're actually now expanding to create a, a regional coalition of airports and ports that will also do this training. So we're talking to the port of Portland, Vancouver, and all these other airports to create a regional uh, approach. And I think that's kind of the next level of work that we can do. Uh, real quickly, I just want to mention that thanks to the efforts that we've done in the last four years, the U.S. Department of Transportation actually gave us an award for anti-human trafficking, uh, anti-human trafficking uh, impact. So I'm very proud of the work that we've and the progress that we've made. Thank you for that, uh, Sam. Of course, very important work. Um, we do have a couple minutes left, and perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about the grant making that you do in the area and how you go about uh, choosing projects. Or yeah, so a lot of the grants that we provide are, uh, they have to be in economic development. And so a lot of these are, you know, uh, promoting certain cities, for instance, I think Kirkland and Bellevue got tourism grants. Um, in federal way, we gave a grant out to um, build a garden down there. Um, and so they can also be environmental uh, initiative as well. Uh, this is part of our effort to, you know, use some of our funds to build community and to make a positive impact. Uh, we put out RFPs, a request for proposals regularly that uh, actually allow for cities and their economic development departments to apply. And obviously we score them, we interview them, and then we give out grants regularly to those cities uh, the, uh, based on kind of the criteria that we put out there. Uh, we've, we've been able to give out millions of dollars over the last several years. Uh, and then I mentioned the South King County Fund, that's a, a separate fund that is specific to South King County because we felt that it was crucial that we made sure that those uh, near airport communities got uh, resources dedicated for themselves. Thank you so much. If somebody has one to round out our time, we just have a, a short minute left. And alternatively, Sam, you can tell us something that we haven't touched on today or another interesting piece that people don't know about. Um, there's so much about the uh, about the port that you know um, that is is so crucial. But one thing that I've been going around saying is that you know our port is one of the most unique ports in the nation, if not in the world. If you think about it, our jurisdiction is both an airport and a seaport. But we also have cruise terminals, grain terminals, commercial marinas, uh, and everything in between. You know, a lot of ports have these things, but no port has all of these things. I challenge anyone here to find a port that has all these different lines of businesses. And what that gives us is a unique opportunity to lead when it comes to sustainability and technology. That's why I'm so bullish on the Port of Seattle. That's why I think we truly, when I say a port of the future, uh, you know, I think we can really build a port that we can all be very proud of. And so I hope uh, everyone having heard about the port a little more today is as excited as I am uh, about all the opportunities that will be coming in the next five to 10 years. And uh, hopefully we'll be building a port that you guys are all going to be proud of. Thank you so much. I, I myself have found that there are a lot of things I don't know about port, so it's really helpful and hopefully for our other voters as well. Um, all right, so that is our time and we will stop the recording and thank you for coming.